to the pond over the next number, next number of years between Spain and, and all of that. So 2026, 2027. Right, right. Yep. All right. Seven o'clock, I guess. <sighs> hey, it's Stephen Ramsden, live from Atlanta, GA. Good to see everybody. Thank you for hey, signing on. Um, we are <laughs> looking forward to a, a good meeting this month. We've actually got something planned in the meeting. And um, besides being friendly and me telling jokes, which I'm sure everyone's happy about. Um, the sun is on fire right now. Get it on fire. And um, yes, thank you. Thank you. I'm here all day. Um, <laughs> I wanted to tell you, uh, we're going to start our fundraiser October 1st until October 31st. And I know everybody in here doesn't need to hear that, but that's going to start. And there'll be post uh, locking up the board for that again. Unfortunately, we have to do that twice a year. Um, I would rather pull my toenails out uh then do fundraisers but that's just the way it is here in the United States. that's okay we can do that for you yeah pull my toenails up okay thank you yeah <laughs> um i've been to i've been to australia and i know that that's not an idle threat um <laughs> so i want to tell you a story about my buddy sean um who's with us uh sean's one of those one of those people that everybody wants to know as their friend because sean is just Hey, he's adorable. He's just a handsome guy. He's friendly. He's got a great smile. He's always laughing and funny. Um, B, he is always there when you need him uh, or if you just want somebody to talk to. Uh, the guy has experienced life. He's curious about science. He's experienced grief. Uh, he's a wonderful, well-rounded person. He's got a couple of kids, a uh, family, and a job. Like, you know, like all of us, he's got all these responsibilities, but he still takes the time out to be friendly and nice to people and help help people out. And I really like that. Um, speaking of helping people out, we were at the nature preserve at one time clearing some bamboo. So we're cutting down a forest of 50 foot high bamboo trees that are just this close together. You know, it's horrible. You couldn't you couldn't push anything through there. You had to cut each one with a with a saw and then hand it to somebody and they had to pull it out. And so I've got this big 30, 40 foot piece of bamboo that I'm pulling out, covered in sweat and bugs. And John's over there uh, waiting for me to hand it to him. And I'm, I'm pulling it out, pulling it out, pulling it out. And it gets all this stress built up on it. And then it hits the last, the last uh, thing blocking it. And it was bent like that. And it just went smiling and opened back up and hit Sean right in the face. Okay. Uh, and this is a big, thick bamboo stalk, very thick and very hard, and hit him so loud it sounded like uh, a home run hitter smacking a baseball. And uh, we thought he was dead. So <laughs> uh, he just looked at me and smiled and said, huh, and then kept on working, and that was it. So he was wearing a pair of safety glasses uh, that pretty much saved his, his vision and his nose that day. So I thought that was a really funny story about Sean. And he volunteered to come back out and help some more after that. Uh, he's just a good guy. He's a good guy. And uh, here in the South, we call it, he, he, he's a solid friend. And um, I can count those on one hand. So Sean has agreed to give us a little presentation today about the upcoming annual eclipse and some information about it and just uh, get, the, get the conversation started. And Sean, I made you a co-host, so you can share to the screen whenever you're ready. Uh, does anybody have any um, any business they want to do before our presentation starts? Okay, then, Sean, it is all yours, my friend. Thank you very much for taking the time to do this on top of all the other stuff you had to do already. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Um... Just before everything, I decided to change all of my gear. You know, I know you should never change anything before a big presentation or anything like this. I've got a new monitor, new headset, new everything. So first off, can you hear me okay? Yeah. So okay. can. Yes. All right. Yeah. And yep. the the I'm just trying to share just the window. Is the is it coming across okay? It's not giant or mouse mouse type or anything like that. Does it look okay? Yeah. Looks good. It looks fine. Okay. It's fine. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, so we're here to talk about the upcoming annular eclipse uh, that's October 14th, 2023. 
Um, I've heard a couple people say uh, they're traveling to it, and uh, I'm traveling as well with some friends. Uh, we went, the same friends that I'm traveling with, we went to the 2017 eclipse, and as soon as that was done, we all said we want to do this again. So we all booked our calendars for this one and the next one. Uh, and I also heard a uh, comment about the Spain eclipse. That's uh, that's on my little planner here too. Um, maybe in 2026, I'll be able to get over there for that. Um, so uh, the annular eclipse. We'll start with, uh, there's three main types of eclipses and uh, notice not to scale. So uh, the first type is uh, a lunar eclipse, when the Earth casts its shadow onto the moon. Um, the second type that we're more interested in is a solar eclipse, where the moon casts its shadow on Earth. And then the eclipse that no one has seen yet, and hopefully we don't in any time soon, is the Apocalypse, eclipse, where the sun is between the Earth and the moon. It's my little joke uh, there for Steve, for the uh, Stephen, for the joke hour. <laughs> All right, carrying on. So uh, total solar eclipse versus uh, annular eclipse. Uh, it's basically differences in solar geometry. Uh, so a total solar eclipse, uh, the moon is close enough to the Earth uh, to fully cover the sun's disk. Uh, so that's when the moon is at perigee. Uh, the annular eclipse, uh, in its orbit, the moon is far enough away uh, to be too small to cover the sun's disk, and it's going to give us that uh, ring of fire that we've all been hearing about, uh, which is uh, the moon is at apogee in its orbit. Um, we have several eclipses uh, per year, partials, things like that, throughout uh, all over the Earth. Um, with a total solar eclipse of about every 18 months. Um, so on average, um, a solar eclipse will occur at the same location once every 375 years. So are eclipses as rare as the media likes to report? Well, it depends on how you want to look at it. It's not so far, not really rare for Earth since we get one about every uh, 18 months. Uh, but for a given location, eh, maybe you could uh, maybe you could call that uh, rare. Um, a little bit more about the geometry through uh, cosmic coincidence is uh, how I like to think of it. The sun is roughly 400 times further uh, from the Earth than the moon, and it's also 400 times larger than the moon. But with that uh, geometry there, they're almost the same size in the sky. Their apparent diameter is about the same. Uh, and the Earth's orbit around the sun is uh, elliptical, as is the moon's orbit around Earth. So those distances are constantly changing, and that's how we get into uh, those two different uh, sizes and the two different types of uh, solar eclipses with uh, perigee and apogee. Uh, when the, where the moon is in its orbit. So why don't we get an eclipse every single month? Um, the moon's orbit is tilted by about, uh, by about five degrees to the plane of the ecliptic. Uh, so more often than not, the moon passes above or below the sun and the lunar shadow misses the earth completely. Um, but about every uh, 173.3 days, a new moon passes through one of two crossover points called nodes, and the solar a solar eclipse is possible. Um, after 6,585 days, a little over 18 years, uh, the entire eclipse cycle repeats. So they follow this cycle called a Soros cycle, which I'll show you a, an image of those next. Um, when two eclipses are separated by a period of one Saros, which is the 18 years, uh, the Sun, Earth, and Moon re return to approximately the same relative uh, geometry, and a nearly identical eclipse occurs, except that it's uh, the path of the next eclipse is shifted west um, by about eight hours and a little bit north by several hundred miles. 
um, and that's one third of Earth's rotation. Uh, between 2023 and 2033, uh, there's eight annular eclipses, uh, six total eclipses, two hybrids, and eight partials. Uh, so we've got a lot to look forward to coming up over the next decade. Um, it's just a matter of will they come to you or will you go to them? So those sorrow cycles, uh, here's what they look like over time. So looking here in 1937, this particular image is for sorrow cycle 136. Um, you see here it's mostly over the Pacific. And then 18 years later, it's shifted to the west. And uh, we get that over uh, Indonesia, uh, China, and I guess Vietnam. And then another 18 years, it's over Africa. And these keep shifting over time. The shape kind of remains the same of the path of totality or the path of annularity uh, until it, uh, it starts either at the north or the south pole, depending on where that particular sorrow cycle starts uh, and work, will work north or south um, for that particular one. This one's uh, working south to north. And we see we've got one in 2045. So that's very, very close to being on top of uh, Charlie, Charlie Bates Solar Astronomy Project headquarters. Um, we wait a little bit longer until. Yay. Yes. <laughs> if we wait a little bit longer until 2078, uh, that one will be right on top of uh, Charlie Bates uh, Solar Astronomy headquarters. So uh, hopefully we'll have a meeting on that day where we can all watch it together. From the grave. <laughs> oh, let's see. OK, so during the annular eclipse, what are some of the things that we're going to be able to see? Uh, so you have the stages of the eclipse. Of the eclipse. Uh, first contact, second contact. So. We're a little bit beyond first contact here. First contact's just basically when the moon first touches the disk of the sun. Uh, second contact is when it's almost uh, beginning annularity. Maximum of eclipse instead of uh, totality, it's uh, referred to as annularity. Uh, then we have third contact as the moon's disk begins to move off of the sun and fourth contact when it's totally, uh, when it's doing the, the last bit of touch and finally moving off the disk of the sun. So some of the things you can see during that time are, are Bailey's beads. Uh, so you would see those uh, as second contact and third contact are occurring. And that is uh, the rays of the sun racing through the topology of the moon and you get bright bursts of light as uh, that disk of the moon is moving onto or off of the sun. Uh, I've read a lot about that. That's tricky to photograph, getting uh, exposure correct. Um, I do have some links throughout uh, these slides if anybody wants them at the end where you can uh, read a little bit more about that if you're going to be taking uh, pictures of and trying to capture uh, capture those. I don't think that's something I'm going to try and go for, uh, but it looks like it uh, makes some beautiful pictures. Uh, some of the other things we can see are uh, we are in solar maximum, so uh, sunspots are a plenty. Hopefully we will have some nice big ones. And maybe we'll be lucky and uh, be able to uh, see some of uh, Wilson effect of the sunspots if we happen to have one on the sun's limb, uh, which if you're not familiar with that, they're just kind of a depressed appearance of the sunspot when they're really positioned close to the solar limb. So I'm really hoping we get lucky there and have some sunspots on the solar limb to maybe see something interesting there. The crescent shadows are really cool that uh, get produced uh, during the uh, uh, ramp up to annularity. Uh, back during the total, total solar eclipse, that was one of the neatest things to see is just these weird 
uh, shadows showing up as the sun filters through uh, the leaves of trees. I even saw some people with uh, kitchen colanders and getting a neat pattern coming through all the individual holes of the colander. So uh, take your colander with you to uh, get some maximum crescent shadows. And the other neat thing that I'm really looking forward to seeing is uh, the lunar edge and uh, the topography of the moon, depending on uh, the telescope you're looking through. Um, I've got a, a neat video from uh, one of my friends at, or, or my brother-in-law introduced me to somebody at, uh, at NASA and they gave me uh, this video to show uh, that we can see as the sun, as the moon is coming across the sun, we should be able to see some of the, the mountains uh, at the base or the south pole of the moon. And there's some of the names of them. Uh, the Leibniz Beta has recently been renamed to Mons uh, Mountain after a NASA, NASA mathematician and computer program, Melba Roy uh, Mountain, M-O-U-T-O-N. So that looks like that should be pretty interesting to, to see that. So as for me, um, here's some of the equipment I'll be using. I've got a couple of uh, hydrogen alpha telescopes. Um, I hope to set up uh, the Coronado Solar Max 3 for visual. Uh, since that one's double stacked, uh, running the LUNT LS50 uh, up to the iMac and Astro IIDC. And I'm going to take my refractor with uh, for white light and use the Herschel wedge. Uh, that's the only one that I'm a little concerned about, depending on where I am with numbers of people. have to just keep an eye on that one to... Uh, make sure nobody uh, messes with the Herschel wedge there. And then, of course, solar glasses. The annular eclipse is a glasses on uh, the whole time for observing. Uh, I've got quite a few to give away. I've gotten some that I've gotten from Stephen. And I know Stephen mentioned uh, at the last meeting, Rainbow Symp Symphony was having some uh, supply chain issues, I believe. So earlier way earlier in this year, maybe it was late last year, I scooped up about 100 of those uh, to he have in my uh, arsenal to give out to anybody who wants uh, solar glasses. Uh, to see what my gear looks like, uh, that's, that's my whole setup there uh, with the PC instead of the Mac in this particular thing. And you can see there on the bottom uh, some southern staples sitting on the ground of Chick-fil-A and a Coke. Uh, I know it's the wrong kind of Coke for Steven, but uh, it is uh, the original real deal Coke. So here's what the path of annularity looks like through the United States. Um, and as you can see through the inset, it dips down over uh, the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico and across uh, South America. So I'll be in the San Antonio area, and I'll show you a little bit closer on the uh, the map coming up next. I have the same map that's uh, over my shoulder there in uh, inset in the pictures. Uh, so I'll be in the San Antonio, Texas area. We're going to be keeping a close eye on the weather to hopefully move northwest or southeast, depending on uh, how the weather treats us. Uh, I know it's a crapshoot. Uh, we have a big astro astronomical event, and that means uh, the uh, astronomy uh, gods are going to put clouds on top of us, so we've got to be prepared to move. Some of the other uh, neat places to see in the U.S. are uh, four corners, where four different states intersect, uh, Bryce Canyon, Utah, and Crater Lake, Oregon. So i got a few uh, close-ups of those coming up. So for me, uh, we'll actually be staying right outside of the path of annularity as I figured out for both eclipses. Uh, my ideal goal was to be somewhere in this box. But as I started to try and make reservations several months ago, things were either already booked or the prices greatly inflated to what I didn't want to pay. 
So for the annular eclipse, I'll be right here outside of uh, the path of annularity. And for the total eclipse, I'll be over in this direction to head north. The good thing about where I am for the path of annularity is uh, I have this stretch of highway here, Interstate 10. It gives me 275 miles or 442 kilometers uh, of open highway to try and dodge the weather. Uh, so here's the uh, map of four corners. Uh, maximum annularity is almost dead on top of where those four states meet. And that's a pretty neat spot in the US uh, because they have a uh, monument there where you can uh, be in four states simultaneously, uh, only, only one person on the ride at a time, unfortunately. So I'm not sure what they're going to be doing at this particular location, uh, but if I had some place to go uh, other than Texas, uh, I would definitely try to go there. And then as far as just rare uh, or raw beauty, uh, Bryce Canyon, uh, it goes right through Bryce Canyon. Uh, if I could, that's another place if I could be there with uh, the eclipse being right up here in the picture, that would be a, a phenomenal picture to take, as would uh, Crater Lake, Oregon, uh, another just lovely place to be uh, if I could be anywhere. So I hope everybody that is going to be um, out taking pictures, hopefully uh, we'll get a lot of uh, composites uh, of anyone that's traveling uh, to, to be able to post those. Uh, those are really cool to see those go across in either one long string or uh, this rectangular bit here. And if you're not familiar with it, uh, this site is uh, one of my favorites uh, to go to for eclipse planning. It has all of the eclipse, all of the upcoming eclipses, total, annular, and if you just go to that one eclipse that you're looking for, this is the annular eclipse. It overlays it on Google Maps. It is very zoomable. And wherever you go, once you find a spot you want to go to, you can just click on it and it will give you all of the details of where uh, C1 through 4 is and max annularity. It is a free site that is one of the best out there for eclipse planning. And, uh, oops, wrong direction. And so that was it for me. I just uh, kind of put together uh, the basics of it. Um, okay, if you got any questions, uh, I'll happily answer what I can answer or we can discuss it. And like I said, I have this whole, um, uh, links throughout this presentation. So if anybody wants a copy of that, wants any more details, I'm happy to post it uh, to the Solar Chat forum. Yeah, that guy, uh, Javier Cubier, um, <clears throat> him and that other guy, Mike, uh, the one that got the picture of the eclipse from the airplane with him hollering in the background. Yep. Uh, I forget his name, but they both came by the house before the 2017 eclipse and uh, hung out here for a while. And uh, Javier, Javier uh, can barely speak English, and he's about five feet tall. Um, and he was a, a curious little fella. He, he was real. He was really funny. Um, but he does have the best uh, eclipse map out there, um, in my opinion. I gave them both some uh, Chiliac handheld spectroscopes and some glasses nice. when they left, and I uh, never heard from either one of them again. But Mike, Mike Kendrianicus. Kendriatus, whatever, the guy that was looking at the eclipse from the jet and was going, oh my God, oh my God, over and over again from the jet. But um, yeah, so from Atlanta, we're going to get what, 50% during the annual eclipse? Uh, yes, uh, it's 50% and, um, and uh, I can, if you don't. A have little bit that. longer crescent, crescent than we would during a total eclipse, if I'm not mistaken, more of a smiley face. Yes, um, I, I agree. And I think uh, so that starts, uh, the eclipse starts in Atlanta at 11.44 a.m., 15.44 Zulu. 
Awesome. And meets, reaches max eclipse at 1.13 p.m. or 17.13 Zulu. Did you uh, print me out a custom report for the marsh location? Uh, I can get that for you as well. <laughs> yeah, I'll probably be down there uh, bird watching and doing a live broadcast or something. But you're going to have more fun as long as you don't get clouded out. Is anybody uh, on the forum going down to San Antonio for this eclipse? No plans to travel very far. Yeah. Is anybody on the hotel. center line? Nobody's already on the center line here, are they? No. Nick Spencer, what are you what are you gonna get? Um a zero percent eclipse, I think, along with Alexander. You know, Alexander, you're welcome to come to the march to watch the eclipse. All right. Uh, Sean, I appreciate all this information, um, and we're going to record this and make it available because, uh, just like all of you, everybody, every time there's a celestial event, um, at any everybody calls their friend who knows astronomy, and that's all of us. So everybody wants to know, you know, the day before, hey, uh, what settings do I use for the eclipse? Buy my camera, or hey, uh, should I buy a solar telescope? Like they want to get into it a week before. The eclipse happens, and uh, they're always disappointed with that. And I tell everybody, man, just go enjoy it with your eyes. Um, it's great to get a, a good photo of an eclipse, but none of us are going to come close to the, to the pros' photos out there. And uh, I learned during the 2017 eclipse that the most beautiful part of it was just looking at the eclipse itself with my eyeballs and looking at the people around me watching the eclipse was the most, most fun of anything. Seeing the shadows on the trees and everything just watching the people. So I, I plan on uh, doing that. I, I plan on just watching people watching. And, and uh, you know, we're not going to be able to look at it naked out down here. Of course, nobody is. Um, I do. I did save 400 pairs of glasses to give away for these two eclipses. And I haven't been able to get any more from Rainbow Symphony. I can't buy them or get them donated for some reason. Um, we just sent... Uh, 6,500 pair I've been saving for uh, Professor Marcelo Salza in Brazil at our affiliate down there, and I just shipped those off. Um, it took us three months to find a way to get them there because uh, it's, it would have been $3,000 to ship them UPS, and I did that last time during the eclipse. But this time, I just couldn't afford to spend $3,000 on shipping two pairs, two boxes of glasses. So... Uh, he finally got the Brazilian embassy in Washington to agree to help him get the glasses there. And I was really shocked to find out how difficult that was. Um, and it was the same way with Kosovo. They just aren't interested at all in doing any of that science and stuff through the embassy. Um, and I was also really surprised to find that there's not a single government uh, agency in Brazil that's planning anything for this eclipse or providing solar glasses or doing anything for it. I found that kind of, kind of disturbing. I mean, the eclipse is going right through the middle of the Amazon and right through the middle of their country and there's not a single event plan. Nobody's gotten anything good. So we will be, all of us at Charlie Bates will be the only people in the entire country of Brazil uh, giving away solar glasses. <laughs> really Thanks. amazing. Uh, it's, that's a, it's a different world. And I, the last time I went there would probably be the last time I go because uh, when I was at the airport, I had a telescope with me in a suitcase and this young guy came up and approached me and told me he was from the university to take me back to the, to the school. So I just figured he was. And I started walking out of the airport with this guy and it turns out he was not from the university. He had just made that up. He was a professional kidnapper. And they got me almost into a car uh, that had three other guys in it that definitely were not from any university. They were all covered in tattoos. And, you know, I was just this close to getting stuck into a car with four thieves and taken away from the airport. Uh, and that was in Rio de Janeiro, one of the, you know, probably the busiest airport in South America. So I decided that I was not going back to, uh, to Brazil again. But um, who else has got some great plans for this one? Or is everybody saving it up for April? I know the, the total eclipse. I'd rather see the annual eclipse myself, to be honest with you. I think it's cooler looking. I think the pictures will be much easier to take 
it'd be much, much better photo opportunity, uh, especially like Sean said, with a, a great foreground, like Alexander's Garden would be a great foreground. Um, Crater Lake or any of those places, you know, the annual eclipse is so dramatic looking. Uh, and I'm kind of, I'm kind of looking forward just to seeing the uh, crescent be have a little bit longer ends on it during the annual than it would during a total. So, so that's what we're going to do. Well, I think, I think it'll help a little bit, even if we're a little bit clouded. Uh, you you can get pictures through the clouds instead of worrying yeah. about can you see the uh, correct. Right, that's true. Going to be really cool looking. Yeah. Question there uh, on the um, Bailey's beads and I suppose resolution and aperture. Um, I'm planning in to bring because I'm traveling over and I'm, you know, I'm fairly limited to what I can bring. I'm just bringing a, a camera lens and kind of view us through the live view mode on the camera. Um, but it'll only be an effective aperture of about maybe three inches, something like that. You know, I kind of wonder how much of the lunar edge or Bailey's breeds I'd really see. I'm kind of wondering, Sean, um, or anyone else, if there's um, any ideas or, you know, um, I'd, I'd love to have a larger aperture, obviously, but, uh, you know, it's obviously uh, limitations, you know, uh, but I'd be just interested in your thoughts on the show. Uh, so I found a link um, that did mention uh, the difference on uh, uh, if it's a crop sensor or not crop sensor. Um, mm. So that's definitely getting out of my wheelhouse. I don't have a DSLR, but I did find some links. Let me look through my um links that i did put into the slides and what i saved off to the side and mm. see if i can find that for you because that would okay. it, it did mention some things about that that you do have to be prepared and be prepared to adjust a little bit because the bailey's beads are going to come in kind of bright and blow out that one side that they're on mm. because obviously it'll be solar filter on all of the time so i, I suppose what i have in my head is it's the same exposure length all the time, I would have thought. Yeah, I think there's a, a, a bit of a difference. Um, okay. And yep. Steven's kind of smiling there. I don't know if he's found a link for that, but- Yeah, I'll, it constantly changes, yeah. And okay. I posted a link on my Facebook page that I'll run and get real quick and post it in here from a guy, but it, it, the exposure constantly changes, the, the perfect exposure. Yeah, you'll get some great images uh, with the same exposure all the way through. Um, and especially a good video, but if you want it to be right, you have to constantly adjust on every exposure. Yeah, um, so I mean, I, I could take raw first of all, and I could bracket it. I mean, that'll help. That's the way to do it. Bracketing, uh, you know, yeah. if you can get two shots on each side of center line with your DSLR, uh, you should be good. And I mean, you know, two stops, at least two yeah. stops with each shot mm. on each side of the center line. I'd be shooting that the entire time because I mean, you know, you don't have to worry about using film anymore. You're not going to fill up your memory card. Um, yeah. But it's very difficult to get the mountains focused, the lunar mountains and all that focused uh, with a color DSLR with sunlight in the image because the sunlight just blows everything out. And you have to go so low to get rid of the overexposure that you can no longer catch the details of the mountains. It's very difficult. Mm. But there, there are guys that, that, that do it, and there's a whole website about that, that there's, uh, what do you call it? There's macros that people have written for Canon EOS, backyard EOS, that you plug yeah. in and it runs your camera for you, which I would never let any software run my DSLR for me because it's the, you know, the situation is so, is so dynamic. Um, I hope, I hope you get something good with that. And I know you're a very careful person and you know what you're talking about. So you probably already know way more than I do, but don't, don't miss, don't miss watching it, man, because it is just so beautiful. Yeah. watch on a previous solar eclipse i had a little netbook with me and i had a, a computer program like that that just ran it for me and that took all the work out of the way and it did you know i was able to do hdr images i had in my head i didn't even look into it maybe i'm leaving it too late but i had in my head well this will be much simpler <laughs> and, uh, no it's not much it it's much it. harder <laughs> it's much more difficult actually because uh, you you have half the sun uh, totality is never dark. It's, it's, half the sun is bright, the other half is dark, 
during annularity, and then each side slowly changes the whole time through the entire annularity. It's much more dynamic exposure than a total eclipse is. Okay, I need to do my homework. Because <clears throat> yeah, my the total eclipse <clears throat> has three minutes, three minutes of total yeah. eclipse, which is exactly the same exposure everywhere. But the annular eclipse is not like that at all. So, sorry. <clears throat> oh, sorry, maybe to clarify, what I'm bringing with me is a zoom lens. So I'll have the imaging with a crop sensor at about 560 millimeter. Okay, so I kind oh, of that'll, that'll that'll work. Work. so it won't be wide angle. So if it was wide angle image, absolutely, because the, yeah. the landscape is going to get very dark. That would be continuously changing. What I, what I plan is more of a, um, a more zoomed in view of the sun itself so that I'll have yeah. this, the disk of the sun will take up approximately 50% of the height of the sensor. Yeah. And so my exposure is based on the amount of sun that is visible at any one time, just to make sure that that element is, is not overexposed. Well, I wouldn't just put it on auto and hope for the best. But oh, I, don't, no. <laughs> I don't think you're you're gonna. Um, I don't. If you do half the disc and concentrate on half the disc, you'll probably do a lot better than if you try to do the full disc during the annularity. But yeah, you know, yeah, like I say, you're better at this than I am, man. So I'm, maybe you can tell me when you get done. I would. Oh, Alexander, were you waving your hand to say something? Okay, uh, Michael. What I was gonna say is, I think like the live view on the camera. Like yeah. you'll be able to shorten the exposures mm. to the point where you get the Bailey's beads and then grab bracket a few. Uh, the, I went to angular eclipse back in 94 on film. So it was a complete crapshoot, just what you saw through the mm. viewfinder. And the exposures did change because you're going from pretty well full disc to, you know, 50, 60 percent uh, obscured. So as you go into the into the center line you're going to have to change the exposures but i think the uh you have to be quick that's the only thing because bailey's beads don't stay visible for very long yeah yeah and then the other thing i was thinking was well the other option if i wanted to save all that hassle would be to set it on video and record the thing that's what i would do but the problem with video on it's only with the newer i have a, a 60d so 60d is based on oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. a setting at the very start of your video and then it keeps that constant the whole way through it doesn't uh yeah. right it doesn't adjust throughout yeah. the video yeah that's going to be tough plus it, the would, it would not be better in video with the 60d it would be better in video with say a, a, a r5 or a 1d but not with the 60D because of exactly what you said. It goes with that setting and that's it. Exactly. So I'm thinking maybe if I just take an expo, you know, try and take as many exposures as I can and I can stitch the frames together as a video after if I want. Yeah, that's what I would do. But you're going to be spending the entire time looking at, at the camera and, you know, not and, enjoying and that, the and, and that's what I don't <laughs> want to do. <laughs> you know? Okay. Uh, so I need to do some more homework. I just put a couple links in the chat that may help. I still haven't found the one uh, that I mentioned. Like it had a, a chart of, of uh, crop sensor and all sorts of information. So I'll keep looking. Yeah, I know uh, Fred Espinak has a standard kind of chart like that. Uh, all right, so maybe that, was on, maybe that was on his website. The, the I, one in I, so uh, yeah, I'll have a look at those. And okay. I wanted to go out that old program I had before on one of those timer ones, see if it, if it works for Angular as well. What are you mm. gonna What are you gonna use for a uh, filter? You just uh, have oh, some um, film a or piece, what? Piece of, a piece of beta. Uh, oh. Yeah, that's already made. So I have that nice. from the last trip. So it's trying to keep everything, you know, in a suitcase. Bring on board uh, the aircraft. Um, small little light tripod. Hopefully, I don't have issues with airport oh. security if I meet the wrong person or anything. Right. And where did you, you said you were going, were you going out to like Utah or New, New Mexico? Yeah, I'm heading to uh, Monument Valley. Okay. But obviously, but that's the plan. Uh, accommodation, like you was uh, getting in about a year ago, trying to book everything. And uh, before you got crazy, it's silly at the moment. Um, yeah. But of course you're, you're, you know, who knows on the weather. I, I was looking on the weather for, for the area and uh, sorry for the, the forecast for the next week is about Three days of rain and three days, three or four days or something. So it's kind of 50 50. Yep. Yeah. And what time of the day is it going to be where you're going? It's in the morning time, I think about 10, 11 a.m., something like that. Uh, 
There is a time okay. zone, three time zone difference because it's just on the yeah. just in Utah. So it's literally one or two miles north of Arizona. So I need to just yeah. need to make sure I don't miss it by an hour. Well, that's a <laughs> yeah. super, super dry area there. The humidity yeah. is always really low. So I don't think you're going to be have nearly the worry about clouds as you would here in Georgia or Florida. Yeah, I think I'm just going to make sure because uh, I'm looking at uh, Xavier Jubier's site. At least all the times are in UT. So I might be just on UT time that day. Let's see. Are you stopping in Atlanta on your flight? Uh, no, it's through the Dallas. Ah. Yeah, that should be 1030 local time. 1030. OK. Yeah, and it's saying it's um, C2 to C3, 9, 13, four and a half minutes. Well, that's that's plenty of time to mess up and try again. Oh, that's a shit. Yeah. <laughs> Don't forget your battery. <laughs> yeah, I know, and it's yeah, yeah. I, I bought a little mount as well, so at least I just want that to track the sun and uh, and then plenty of batteries for the camera itself. So mm -hmm. let's see. Very good. So, is anybody having any uh, issues with the forum or anything they want to yell at me about? Good. Awesome. Nick, what are you doing back there? Yeah. I know you got something to say. Nick Spencer, I can see from the look on your face, you have something to say. Hey. <laughs> yeah. No, I'll be uh, just looking forward to seeing everybody else's uh, trips to see the eclipse and looking forward to seeing the images after. I'm not much of a flyer myself, so, you know, I'd be a bit scared to go over. <laughs> it's not safe. It's not safe. Can, can, can you swim? That's, yeah, I could go on a ship. That would be fine. <laughs> well, me and Ralph can tell you, uh, it ain't safe. So, yeah, your, your fear is rational. <laughs> exactly. Get yourself a first class ticket, plenty of booze, you'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That said, I would be interested in trying to see the one in Spain. So uh, that being a bit nearer, that's possible. It's just such a long way, isn't it? If the weather doesn't yeah. pay off, but you know, yeah. not wishing everybody, you know, clear skies with it anyway. The more you practice, uh, the less fear you have of flying, and you know, the longer <laughs> distance would just seem easier and easier. Yeah, twenty twenty six goes to the north of Spain in August twelfth, and. 2027, sorry, I have uh, Fred Espinax uh, here, and my wife is actually big into this as well, uh, and um, 2027, August 2nd, it goes to the southern tip of Spain, down around the Rock of Gibraltar, yeah. and for people who really want to go into their history, it goes right through the uh, Egypt as well, around the um, some of the pyramids, but obviously that's August in um in egypt that's going to be 40 something degrees so good luck with that no. No. yeah no north north of spain is uh, quite mountainous um so who knows and it's going to be low near the horizon you can see where the eclipse ends so that's in 2026 that's 2026 that one does it yeah. just stop at palma it doesn't go over ten. that's it the sun is set at that stage Oh, I see. That's too bad. Mark's going to bad. Iceland for that one because it goes yeah. from through Iceland. Oh, it goes through Iceland. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll probably still be alive in 2026. That's, that's not so far away. I'll be dead. I think we should all go to Iceland for that, man. Well, yeah. Uh, cloud prospects, I'd say, will be 99.9%, .9%, I'm sure. I, I would agree. <laughs> I, I love Iceland too, but uh, you may. Uh, There's a time. Part There's a time and a place. <laughs> right. Uh, would it be great there? Because that's such a beautiful place to visit. My friends just got back from there and they went in the summertime. I was like, what is wrong with you, man? You, you're not even going to see any northern lights in the summertime. But, we, yeah, we, right. we, should, we, we should have a trip actually as a group to northern latitude and have 24 hour solar observing. Hmm. Yeah, but then you come in, to, everybody would have to bring their PSD, you know, that's, that's about all you can carry with you. Yeah. We could all come here and use all my telescopes. <laughs> Free airfare for our Australian friends, too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>
All right. Well, it sounds like everybody's got things to do. Did anybody have anything else they wanted to bring up? I wanted to tell you again how grateful I am. Uh, I know I don't participate in the forum as much as I used to, but I do read every post and I do uh, see what's going on, and I'm real grateful. Uh, it's really become quite a spot on the internet for references, and thanks to Alexander and Mark um, and our spectrograph guy. Uh, you know, it's really well organized and easy to use. So uh, now that we're on DreamHost, it seems to be running pretty good. Although Network Solutions did bill me several hundred dollars last week to update our SSL certificate on the Solar Chat forum. Oh, they just billed it. They didn't even ask. And when I, I called and reminded them that our domain doesn't exist on your server anymore. So why are you charging me for an SSL certificate? Uh, it took me like an hour on the phone to explain to the person I was talking to that I should not be paying you for that. But um, anyway, so that's about it. I will record this and put it up on YouTube and get it going today. And we will do this again next month. And anybody who would like to do a presentation or something or live solar, just let us know on the forum. Okay. Hey, everybody. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, all right. Sean. Adios, Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Sean. Take care, all. Bye -bye. Yeah, as you will.